Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight. I, I really appreciate you being here with me. It's a beautiful, beautiful night. So what I can, I, I, my, if you know, my name is Alina Smolansky, and I've been painting. But before that, before I, I would like to explain how I got into icon painting, because it's such a surprise. I have a different profession. I was in a technical background. I have engineering background. I have also writing background and communications. And then I became into writing. And the first question when I wanted to talk about tonight and uh, share with you my path, my first question was how, how did a person who grew up in an atheistic country, former socialist country, started painting icons quite of a sudden? That's one of the questions I, I was asked. But then, I, and I still, I can't explain. And with this, I would like to share my journey because my icon painting cannot be separated from my journey as a human being, as a, as a person. And that's how I started painting icon because I wanted to know more about the world and I realized it's not only the physical body, there's something else. And that happened about 2006. I was already studying psychology to help me with some emotional issues. And then I discovered at that time through yoga that there was something else. We called God, we called consciousness, we called uh, uh, world almighty. It depends on your uh, thinking. And this, to make a sto uh, long story short, I discovered icons. That was a, and how I discovered it by chance. I was taking my uh, degree program, Royal Roads University, and I was writing about uh, an article. And I decided to write about religions, like a comparative different spiritual path. And at first I thought about, about icons. I don't know why. I checked online, and at first icon I saw that was Andrea Rublov's The Holy Trinity. I saw that icon, and even if I knew about it, and I'm still talking about it, and I have goosebumps. Something happened. Looking at the, at the computer screen, I was, oh, those who know, like it was like energy was surging up. And then I forgot about that experience, almost. I wrote my articles, submitted, and nothing happened. And then six months later, I, by chance, I saw a last flyer on an art supply store about icon painting class with a master iconographer, Vladimir, he taught in Vancouver, Vladimir Blaganadezhdin. And I joined. I didn't know why, I just joined it. Looking, for me, it was like a spiritual path. I wanted to know more because it produced such an effect on me. And I learned, I started reading about icons that it's a complete path. Like those who paint them can attain what I wanted to attain. Unfortunately, that didn't happen because my teacher couldn't give it to me. He was incredible, a skillful master from techniques, but he couldn't give me that, what I desired most of all. So I, ha I had to start search by myself. And I started reading all the books that I could get a hand on about like, um, from an Eastern Orthodox Church, from Greek Orthodox Church, from Catholics, every possible book from that time who can explain what it was, uh, religion and icons in particular. Well, and at the same time, I studied uh, history of icon and icon painting because it's inseparable. So what I discovered, and if probably you know, is a mainstream history, that icons supposedly were invented and designed to teach the illiterate the story from the Bible. That was a very simple explanation because only those were sophisticated who in the, in the church, monks and monasteries who knew how to read. And that, at that time, that was about second, third century. And the 
Christianity, as you know, was persecuted by Romans, and they had to hid in the catacombs, and there they started drawing. The first drawing that probably dated from uh, second, third centuries in the Roman catacombs. And from there, icons evolved. And later, a little bit later, Emperor Constantine, the Roman uh, emperor, decided to convert to, to Christianity with support of his mother, that's Saint Helen. And he established a new capital of new Christian country, Constantinople, modern, modern Istanbul. And eventually it became a, a huge empire, Byzantine empire, that existed for over a thousand years and about which we know so little. And there, the, the birthplace of icons. And not, right away, not right away. The story was that there was a huge controversy about icons, the second commandment. The second commandment that prevents from creating graven images. So, and that was creating images that still no no in some religion like Judaism and um, uh, Islam. Uh, they became the same in uh, Christianity, early Christianity, and all the images that were created before iconoclasm, so they were destroyed, and only few images survived, like from fifth, sixth century, and they uh, preserved in the oldest, the still functioning monastery, Saint Saint Catherine, Orthodox. Uh, monastery near Mount Sinai. So, and that, uh, for example, the icon like Jesus, like the second, like in the middle, this Christ Pantocrator, that's one of the icons from that monastery. And uh, that uh, icon I painted for the workshop that I taught in uh, Victoria a few years ago. They asked, they wanted that image, so I painted it to show the stages, and then we painted together in a retreat in Victoria. So that's a little bit different. It's, uh, it's different because it more simp uh, it's simplified comparing to my regular icons. So that's, uh, I explained why if you have any questions, if you know it is a difference. So that's how uh, icon beca uh, became known in the world probably, and they were established like the right tools for liturgical, liturgical uh, work, probably the eighth century, then finally they had a council and they are approved for work in church. So what are icons? The word icon in Greek means an image, just an image, like anything else. It doesn't mean anything else. You have on your phone, you had uh, icons. It has a square, F or Whatever word to sign, it means Facebook. That's an icon. It represents something. Similarly, if you have a photo on your iPhone of your loved ones, of your family, of your pet, or just a place of your favorite vacation, it doesn't mean that you worship it. But it, it, it exists for you to remind, to create this union. That's why icons were painted in the first place as a create to help believers to maintain that connection with the higher, with the divine. How icons were painted, that's my research, it's probably a less known story about the first icon painters. The story goes that uh, Saint Luke was the first icon painter and he painted Mary and the baby Jesus from like a portrait. Whether it's true or not, but that uh, exists as a story, it's a beautiful story, and also St. Luke's prayer and iconographer's prayer. And every time when we start as an icon painter, when we start painting icons, we start from uh, reciting this prayer. Sorry, I don't remember it. And later I, uh, I started, uh, saying prayers, but more from my heart, not like, not like canonical prayer. But I always, when I start an icon, I always give a moment of focus, concentration, intention, prayer, 
uh, typically I say that oh, our Father, the art in heaven, like my favorite prayer, and uh, start painting. That was, and also that was the way how the first, and and I believe that, and I can feel that how icons existed. Those first icon that became canons, that became established painting for the church. By the way, icons are not free. It's not like we paint them from our mind. They exist because uh, canons are established by the church. So if I, it's not a copy, but I, I use that outline, I use traditional colors to create that image. And there is a reason with it, because those icons, the first ones, were painted a very high level, like saints, uh, monks that practiced prayer, uh, fasting. And they were in state of trance, so they were able to trans transform what they saw, what they experienced on a painting surface. That's why they're so powerful. And then when I look for a prototype to paint, I try to find the earliest one, the first one painted, because I believe that that was like not lost in translation. That was to make an icon an icon. When somebody who is a very high uh, level of attainment, sainthood, of consciousness, is able to use that energy and with pure heart to transfer it on paper and that energy affects people, or those viewers. So that is why was, and the same it goes with art as well. So first you have to know your artist, artist, and connect, a connection with the artist is first through the painting. You may like the painting, but probably you're connecting to that energy that was invested into that painting. So when I would my when I finish my paintings and the icons and other paintings, I meditate, I contemplate on them. I place them in front of me and I uh, focus it's from if you know yoga and I sit and stare at them without blinking like the energy. And I do it like a few days. So I charge them with the energy. Some more, some less, that's true. But uh, that's uh, the process of creating that image. So for me, it was a part of, I was obsessed with icon painting for years. And then something happened. It was a, when I painted the last Sarpa, that icon that I uh, painted, that I had experienced a very serious art crisis in my life. How I painted icons, how I selected icons, that was different. I fell in love. I was looking online, and I fell in love, and I decided I need to paint it, and I painted that. And of course, I painted commissions. That is a different process. Uh, for example, the Black Madonna of Chestakova, that's a, like, with a dark frame, black, that was painted something about it, mysterious. Uh, the story about it, that the wonder making icon and the person who, it was the Turks, when they invaded, invaded Poland and t he tried to damage it, he didn't survive. He fell dead. So that's why there are scars on her face, on the Black Madonna. But I didn't find a true explanation why some icons are paint dark faces, like Madonna and a child. Another one example why I painted a specific icon, it's the one is uh, with the Mary, joyful Joyce, when her eyes closed after she received the annunciation, the news that she's going to be the, um, the mother of Jesus. That was a, a famous icon and used by Saint Seraphim of Sarab, so a person who spent time in solitude, practicing the prayer of the heart, his wonder maker, it was the 18th century. So this was his icon with uh, which he, he contemplated in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, it's called contemplation. It's a, a, state, a state of trance, certain trance. It's not even, uh, it's, uh, this starts after prayer. So first it goes into prayer, and then they get into this 
state of contemplation. And then things happened. We call, you know, if you prefer using modern day language, that probably be uh, elevated state of consciousness. So that was an icon and painted, even if it's a not traditional, strictly speaking, not a traditional icon because your eyes are closed, not looking forward. So icons are not supposed to be true presentations of humans. When the icons became known, they, they tried to take it away from realistic images. They were elongated figures and there's certain features preserved. So that's why I look uh, the same in many, and that's tradition transferred from, like, from master to disciple. Now, so to become a master, an icon, icon painter, you probably need three years just learning with a master iconographer. And at that time, you're not even supposed to show your icons. They all, well, in the old days, they were just chopped and good to firewood. And only after three years, you may be allowed to paint icons uh, as part of a group. But not, and the master was somebody who had 10, 12 years of experience of icon painting. He was like, kind of, now it's everything is, of course, simplified. And women started painting icons as well. There was probably no, no at that time. So and that what happens, I mentioned about uh, the crisis I experienced with the Last Supper. All the, at the very beginning, I was, I always wanted to paint this icon, but I knew that I didn't have skills enough to paint it. And I, and I said, well, at that time, I, when I paint, when I learned, I paint the Last Supper. And then the moment came when I decided to paint the Last Supper. It was for a very specific exhibition. And then when I painted it, something happened. Well, sorry, I have goosebumps. And there was, uh, the world changed for me. I achieved something that I was wanted to do you know, for 10 years. And I couldn't paint for a while. And at that time happened, I was started searching what else, like to have this spiritual connection. Of course, in that, I I studied in Christianity, I studied Judaism, that's some of my paintings shows, because I wanted to learn, okay, so starting with the Judaism for Christians, because I wanted to know what was before, why it was, why, what transferred, uh, what became known in Christian. Uh, I didn't study much Islam, but I studied uh, Judaism, I studied Kabbalah, and also I studied Buddhism, Kashmiri Shaivism and some other religions are still looking for that um, special, something special, certain. So and that what my icon painting career suddenly came to halt. It was very dramatic. I found, or rather neurographic, I found me. And at that time, I felt it was the missing link for me because I wanted to continue exploring the connection with the divine, but but something failed, like meditation and yoga didn't, didn't carry me far enough. So in that time, when I, st and I started neurographic, I neurographic a workshop that I'm, you know, that I'm going to teach next week, next Saturday. So that I started again with the idea of connection. And later I realized that the icons in neurographica they probably have this similarity because they still connect through different ways. The neurographic are much more modern way of connecting us with a higher state. And it allows us to connect through our brain function, through our connection with a higher self, through here, to the same source, because it's one, no matter what we do, no matter what we experience. And if that was my experience, that was my experience. And I also realized since I was a teacher of icon painting, surprisingly, I don't know why, I never intended teaching, but people started coming to me and asking, where can I learn icon painting? Do you teach? 
can you teach me? And then, then I started teaching. And I also transferred my icon painting skills, my egg tempera painting skills, into other artwork. So work, egg tempera, I can't help mentioning because it's such a, this is an example, they are powdered pigments. That's what I use for painting in egg tempera medium. So every paint, every, everything that gives color contains this coloring that colors. But colors by, by themselves, don't, they don't do anything. They have to have a binding agent to make them glue to the surface. So that was, uh, it, it contains in, in its pure form. These are colors and they are pure form. And that temper, why it's so luminous, why it's so pure, and why it's a chosen medium for, act, uh, for icon painting that approved by the church because it has a yolk, like the beginning of life, and it's egg temper, egg yolk, chicken egg yolk, mixed with water and vinegar, mixed together with pigment, and it, it gets attached to the surface, a special prepared surface with fine brush and also layering. There's a layering and a, to achieve that luminosity, layers of paint have to be applied. Depending, it could be like like medieval art, uh, master. There are probably many layers, like 10, 15, 20, like very thin layers. So that's what I use, and I use regular brushes, watercolor brushes. If you artist, you know, you can have a look. Nothing special. There is nothing magic about it. Just regular brushes, and some of them very fine, for fine lines. It's very difficult. I used to teach, and it takes a lot of effort. But it's a forgiving and wonderful, beautiful medium. So then I went in, but I realized that I can paint it even, even I wanted to give to people. I wanted to teach. I wanted to transform my energy. I wanted to share my what I believe. And it didn't work. There was fewer fewer students, and I decided to study neurographic, I become a professional instructor. So I completed the course and became an instructor. And ever since I've been teaching, I continue, continue painting icons, but from 2018, I painted only commissions. That means that people who come to me and ask to paint for specific, whether it's a benefactors for, to give it to a church or for their personal or commemoration or for, for, I know that some for uh, birthdays, for anniversaries, for weddings, as well as for confirmation. That for baptism, early not. No, that was, and also for person who left this world and they wanted to have this uh, uh, feature associated with a saint. Okay, so that was, um, with neurographica, it became, I wanted to use it for art, but it never became my art. I still love icon painting, and that is like my first love. But neuro, neurographica is something different because it has a more practical application for me and for others. So that was my, uh, that I wanted to share. Probably I could share it with you much more, but I decided to, this is better I stop here because I can talk about icons longer. So, and I welcome your questions. If you have any questions about icon painting, icon painting medium, or me as an artist or neurographica, please, please, uh, be happy to answer to the best of my abilities.